uh, the opportunity in whether it's a business or someone's personal uh, uh, life, etc. So what we do is we look for companies that aren't ready for these conversations because they don't have, uh, uh, and it's fine, you use website. I'm going to correct you on that. I don't think we built a website in the last uh, uh, probably year. Usually it's an app. It's some type of mobile uh, application. Uh, we've incubated about half a dozen companies over the last couple of years. Um, one of them, uh, Audix Health, which was a, a healthcare application called Realm Blazer. Uh, this was uh, one of the first extra gaming apps and it was actually a B2B app and it helped uh, health providers to have better uh, communications with their corporations and provide engagement. And it helped the corporations who use the app with the individuals inside of the corporation to become more fit, become more healthy, become, be thinking about it. And by the way, they save money on uh, their, their services. I would always recommend that you start with your audience. Uh, start with questions with your audience. Bring them in to, to is this going to work for them? Um, how is it going to work for them? Use them as the guinea pig, and if they like the idea enough, they might just invest. So, um, But I would say that if you want an investor like me to take your site seriously, you have to have something launched or at least a prototype where you've kind of tested your mock-ups, your wireframes with people who are your consumers and get their actual feedback. You're actually better off doing sketches than spending a lot of time on PowerPoint or, or whatever to make it all nice and pretty because you want the honest feedback and if you show people, most people will be like, oh, that's great, yeah, let me know when it launches. They, you want their honest feedback about what can make it better and you always want to get close and closer to what people want. Paul Graham in Silicon Valley by Combinator talks all the time about make something people want and that's really what you need to do and the only way to do that is to get off your Get off your chair, leave your home, co-working space, office, and go talk to potential users and customers. I personally think for the sake of a couple of hundred bucks, it's a big mistake. But what kind of things, not just can you get from the chamber, but access to the government? Governmental realm. Um, the nice thing about joining a chamber is that you're automatically linked into all of the advocacy efforts that they do, and that's huge for different startups. Um, I can name drop. Uber and Lyft, um, you know, they they need those advocates everywhere that they can find them, and starting with the Chamber of Commerce is brilliant. I know at our chamber, it's $330 a year to start. That's it, forever and ever. Um, and that's a very inexpensive price to pay for advocacy at that level. Um, and then talking about actual governmental funding, that is not my forte, but I did bring notes. I reached out to uh, a few friends that do that every day of their lives. I don't know how detailed I should get. Um, Just stuff that would help, like anything that would help like CBDC, um, Small Business Association, yeah, those so, types of things. Um, so the SBA has something, a program called the SA, um, and this is the largest governmental backed loan program in the country. Um, it encourages lenders to invest who would otherwise think uh, this investment is too risky, uh, which a lot of times with startups I would say that's uh, Case. and it guarantees up to 85% of the loan to the entrepreneur uh, by that traditional financial institution. So they feel a lot safer investing in you. It comes at a price. Um, I believe you have to pay. The leverage that you always need to think of as well is this is someone that's going to bring in cash to do something that you want to do. So it's kind of like a small investment. It's like an, an example of what you can go afterwards in crowdfunding, banking, whatever that could be. So how can you take as much, how can you squeeze this as much as you can and get all the juice it has? Think of the type of person you're bringing in or the type of company that you're bringing in to sponsor. You don't want any company. You want a company that's gonna be relevant to you. And the reason why is because if you bring in Joe Blow to sponsor your company, to your event, whatever that is, the people at your event are gonna say, oh, okay, it's just one more logo on top that I get to look at. But if you bring in someone, let's say that this is a, a tech talk, and you bring in the best developer in the world to sponsor your event, your crowd is gonna be so excited. Not only are they gonna come here with like all the notes that they can, but they're gonna bring their friends, their other coder friends, everyone else. So 
when you think about looking for someone to sponsor your event, your company, think of, of course, what can you offer them, but think more than anything, how can you benefit the most out of that sponsorship? Even startups from some of the best accelerators in Los Angeles, uh, they will start raising 50,000, 100,000, quarter million, 500,000, and every time they're hitting milestones. They're telling investors, we're gonna raise 50,000 from you, we're gonna come back to you for 100 grand more, and we're gonna hit these benchmarks in three months, in two months, whatever. And if they hit them, they will get funding, and they can keep going until their valuation goes from, let's say, a million, when they first joined the accelerator, half a million. They can go up to seven million in a matter of a few, uh, like 10 weeks. And uh, that's that has happened over and over again with LA companies and Santa Monica startups. And when you get to like the size you're gonna get to, so let's take Uber. Sure. How much, how much, uh, as a, uh, you might know this, you might not be able to say, but what percentage would you say they've given away to get, what is it, 1.5 billion or, or something big that they've raised? Yeah. Or what, yeah, is that it? That I actually don't know, but I will tell you that you want to raise money when you don't need it. That's what Mark Zuckerberg did, and he controls so much of the company. The second thing you want to do, if you can get away with it, is have uh, someone on your board of directors or a lawyer support you and get you founder stock. It's very hard to get. So what is important is if they, they're going to be valued on activity of a user group and how valuable access to that user group would be. Um, and so not that's rare. So that would be a social media type of platform. Um, but really it's harder to have an engaged audience than a growing audience. And it's also harder to have low churn than it is to have high growth, I think. And churn is so expensive. So those are things that we're looking at. And the revenue can be figured out later, generally, not always. Um, but if it's a social platform like that, and Yeti is an example, uh, perhaps revenue isn't what their valuation would be based on, right? Even at a later stage. Okay, Excellent. thank, thank you. you. So it's the metadata that's important. Sure. Yeah. Okay.